Archaeologist Randy White is far beneath the hills of France, searching for a special moment in evolution, an era cloaked in mystery, when, with hardly a change in appearance, humans began behaving in ways they had never behaved before. He wants to find out how it was that our ancestors became truly human. It's downright scary to be in these cave environments. They are cold, dark, damp, frightening, dangerous places. When you see people going a kilometer underground or two kilometers underground and you find traces of paintings and that sort of thing, there's something uh, much uh, more profound going on than just an interest in exploration. Perhaps this cave that we're exploring here opens onto our site, which could make, if there were any paintings in this cave, could make them the oldest cave paintings on the planet. It's possible Randy White could one day make a discovery as startling as that made in 1994, when others found underground caverns adorned with over 300 images, some painted 34,000 years ago. The oldest rock art known. But finding art is not the only goal. White wants to find something bigger, how the human mind was born. Where once people had looked at bare walls and had seen only walls, now others suddenly saw astounding possibilities. And with art came human technology, human communication, human culture. The question is, what happened to make all this possible? How could it be that a species opened its mind and burst into a new realm. How was it that human ancestors evolved a whole new way of seeing themselves? And in time, transformed the planet. great rift valley of East Africa. Here is where the human story began. For millions of years, Africa was the landscape of human evolution. Across this terrain, an ancestral people survived, reproduced, and passed on their traits from generation to generation. Without Africa, humanity as we know it might never have evolved. This is an area that was once inhabited by hominids before they were truly human. Now it's a site scientists visit to understand how people lived and what they thought about over a million years ago. Soon after the rains each year, Rick Potts leads a team that scours these badlands, finding stone tools and fossils. Potts believes this place was once a tool-making factory. It takes really sharp eyes to find that first fragment of fossil or to find that sliver of stone tool that says hominids were right here at this spot. And so I knew that we were very close to an ancient soil that was nearly one million years old that had previously produced lots of fossil bones and, and stone tools. 
Okay. It turned out to be a hand axe, one of those stone tools that our ancestors made okay. for a long, long time, hundreds of thousands of years. Okay. These hominids were bringing these rocks down from the highlands, and they were chipping the edges of the tool around, and they could even hold it in their hand like this, use it for, for digging or for knocking off flakes that they could use for, for butchering animals. In a sense, this is the Swiss army knife of the Paleolithic. Here, these Paleolithic or ancient stone tool people made a variety of simple implements repeatedly for nearly a million years. Indeed, their minds were, uh, were oriented towards survival. They had the ability to make these tools, which had some sophistication to them. But the fact that they kept making them means that they had a kind of a, a mental template, a, a, a regularity of thinking uh, that kept producing these same things over and over again. Chances are they didn't speak to one another like we do. And, uh, and apparently they, uh, they got along just fine with this single tool. So a million and a half years this, this was around, which is an immense period of time, an absurd period of time. When you think of today, where, where computer programs don't last for longer than a couple of years before they're improved, before they diversify in some way, uh, and our technology is the same way. It's not the way of the, the technology of these ancient people a million years ago. They didn't have something that we have the creativity, the, the innovation, uh, the diversity of cultures that, of course, characterizes our own species. On the tree of life, human evolution began around six million years ago, when hominids split off from the common ancestor they shared with chimpanzees. They descended from the trees about four million years ago and entered a new world. Two and a half million years ago, with a modified hand, they fashioned stone tools and began to depend more and more on a diet of meat. The size of their brains increased dramatically. And about two million years ago, some began leaving Africa. These early travelers were successful for a while, but in the end, they all became extinct. It wasn't until about 60,000 years ago that the first truly modern humans, our ancestors, began leaving Africa. They were hunter-gatherers, foraging for food, living in small groups, roaming a wide landscape. But they were different from their predecessors. They had begun a revolutionary way of life. This lifestyle had emerged over millions of years through the multiple processes of evolution, mutation, selection, adaptation, competition, failure, punctuated by the occasional success. It was a story of evolution, of change over time, no different from the stories of so many other species, but in the end, it produced results new to the planet. Behavior changed very radically at around 50,000 years ago. This is someone who lived in Israel, let's say roughly 100,000 years ago, this skull. Now you might say, Israel, is that Africa? At the time, in a sense, it was. If you look at where Israel is today, Israel is on the very margin of Africa, and there have been times in the past when Africa expanded a bit ecologically and Israel was effectively incorporated in Africa. This is someone who looks very much like us. And I think if this person were alive today, if we put the flesh back on and dressed this person properly, we wouldn't see any significant difference. It would not be somebody who would cause you to cross the street if you saw this person coming at you from the other direction. And yet, this 100,000-year-old human did not behave like us. And then here, we have a fully modern person, someone who lived in Africa within the last 40,000 years, basically the same kind of skull, particularly the same kind of brain or same shape to the the part of the skull that contains the brain. But this is someone who behaved in a very different way than the prior person. This is someone who made a wider range of recognizable stone artifacts, made a lot of artifacts out of bone and ivory and shell, produced art. People like this 
would be recognizable not only in terms of their appearance, but in terms of their behavior as fully modern humans. In a sense, we're all Africans. If you took a bunch of human babies from anywhere around the world, from Australia, New Guinea, Africa, Europe, and scrambled the babies at birth and brought them up in any society, they'd all be able to learn the same languages, learn how to count, learn how to use computers, learn how to make, to make and use tools. And it suggests that the distinctively human parts of our intelligence were in place before uh, our ancestors split off into the different continents. After leaving Africa some 60,000 years ago, this fully modern species headed east into Asia, and even to Australia. Others followed the coast of the Mediterranean, north, dispersing into the hills, and leaving behind evidence that their minds were unique. Here in Turkey, Mary Steiner and Steve Kuhn have been excavating a home that these early immigrants occupied, a cave called Uchazla, one of the earliest modern human living sites. We're standing in the extreme back of the cave here, and there's been a variety of activities that took place in this part of the site. At a somewhat higher level than the one we're excavating about here, there was a structure, a, a kind of wall of stones that delimited, delimited what we think was a bedding area. A little lower down, what you see is this triangular shape, which is basically a cone of debris, and this was a garbage dump. There's this white material, which is ash, and this sort of yellowish, ashy sediment. And every single one of these white specks is a bone or an artifact. This is just chock full of material. It's a garbage dump. Now, that may not seem very romantic, but as an archaeologist, it's a wonderful thing because garbage is full of evidence about how people lived and what they ate, what they did, how they made their tools. The team hoped they would unearth clues to the routine of life 40,000 years ago. They were in for a surprise. Very quickly after we began excavation here, we realized that we had uh, something truly extraordinary. As soon as we started digging into the sediments, we started finding lots of ornaments, mostly shell beads, but a variety of other kinds of things. They look like teeth when you first encounter them, and my heart rate goes up, and I think, more human fossils. Yep. Yet another. Just Nisarius. Oh, yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, that's Nisarius. And it's got the little it's hole the in it. It's local species here. It's definitely perforated. Oh, yeah. This one's in very good condition, too, even some of the original color of the shell. It's tremendously exciting and sort of daunting because nobody had reported these before from this part of the world. And the, your first thought is, what did I do wrong, you know? To... <laughs> As they worked the layers of sediment, they began finding beads that dated back 43,000 years, making them the oldest beads found anywhere in the world. Now we have nearly 1,000 ornaments, mostly shell beads of a variety of species, but also things like the claw of a large raptor or large predatory bird that's been notched to be suspended in a sort of necklace fashion. They're always selecting the same species. This is an animal that's relatively rare on beaches, but nonetheless does occur in the area. And uh, uniformly, people selected these. You can see also that they've been artificially perforated by a person, so in order that they could be suspended. For the first time in the Upper Paleolithic, people found it necessary in some areas to say things about themselves using durable material items. Durable items like beads are of no use for hunting, gathering, or protection. They suggest that those who lived here had more on their minds than simple survival. So why were these beads so important? And what can they tell us about the early days of modern humans? Beads and artifacts have been found along the routes our ancestors took. 43,000 years ago, humans had spread north to Eastern Europe. Then they moved into the Russian Plain and Central Europe. By the time they settled in Western Europe 38,000 years ago, they were not just making beads, they were mass producing them. 
Nicaragua, Central America. Managua. Here, as in other places of the world, there are those who hardly have any language at all. Maria Noname, Mary No Name. Deaf since birth, she has been isolated all her life, both from the people who could help her and from others with her disability. Her friend, <laughs> linguist Judy Kegel, understands the depth of her isolation. The two can communicate just a little, using simple and primitive gestures. The first time I met her, she was missing the ability to tell me who she was. She was missing the ability to tell me how old she was. She doesn't know her name. In order to tell me who she was, she had to take me home and show me the papers and pictures of her family. Um, we had to share a context. She can tell me things. I can show you a bit. She can tell me what happened to her father. Hmm. I asked her about her father dying, and she said three, OK? What three meant was he was shot three times. I know this from working with the other deaf signer, that she said he was shot in three places. And that's how her father died, right? Yeah. Right. And, uh, you know, but, but three is just not enough to give me access to the information that I would have needed had I not had prior knowledge about that. Papa. Papa. Okay, what she's saying is, I had a daughter that went away and got married, and that was it. She never came back. I had a son that went away, and I never heard from him again. You know, that's it. I'm alone. That's my life. She was language ready. Um, the problem was she didn't get access to language within that critical period. And that critical window for learning language in the way that we learned it is closed. This window for language remains open until we reach age seven. Then it slowly closes as we advance towards puberty. Before the 1980s, many deaf Nicaraguans were like Mary No Name. They never encountered the window for language because they never encountered others with their disability. But in 1980, after the Nicaraguan Revolution, the new government tried to enhance deaf people's lives. It brought deaf village children into Managua to end their isolation. Here, educators tried to teach them an existing sign language. The effort failed. The children showed little interest in learning a language forced upon them. Instead, they began communicating with each other in their own way. Judy Kegel was summoned from the United States to sort out the problem. I came down thinking wherever there were deaf people, there was a sign language, and that obviously there would be a, a full-blown sign language in full swing here in Nicaragua. And this, I said, well, you know, I, I can learn a bit of their sign language if that's what you want and, and work with you on learning it. They said, no, they don't have a sign language. They have, they have mimicas. They have mime gestures. And they pointed to a group of kids and said, we want to know what they're talking about. It turned out they were talking about a lot more than anyone dreamed possible. Kegel had arrived in Nicaragua shortly after the birth of a new language. Language needs company. Language needs a community. Language needs some sort of a trigger. And I think that, I think that trigger is, it's not so much that it needs a community in the sense that there have to be lots of people, but a part of being a community is wanting to share information with each other. Might this moment resemble what happened around 50,000 years ago? the turning point that led to the explosion of human creativity? Language does not need a voice. It is our legacy, an inevitability of being human. Today, 
we still don't know exactly when language evolved, when it opened the door to our phenomenal success as a species. This is a verb reduplicated. But language, every language, depends on strict rules, all of them familiar. That's a roll shift to looking at a man looking at the bird, then back to the man falling off the mountain, have dreaming that he's going to fly like a bird. While many species can communicate, even vocalize, only human languages are driven by complex rules. Every one of our world's 6,300 languages has them. We call them syntax. In her isolation, Mary No Name never encountered syntax, but it is commonplace in the children's language. Syntax isn't the set of rules that you learned in your third grade grammar that you had to memorize so you spoke English the way you're supposed to. Syntax is, or language, the constraints on language are something that all human beings share. They're the constraints that are imparted to us by the fact that we share a single human brain. They are the, not just the constraints, but the ability to hierarchically organize information that allows us to construct sentences, novel sentences that have never been said before, that allows us to, put, to, to tell a story, that allows us to prophecy, that allows us to lie. I can surely communicate for communication's sake when I have syntax, then I can truly use a language. And those most gifted with the tools of language might have been the ones to prosper, according to Richard Dawkins. We don't know when language started, but as soon as language did start, it provided an environment in which those individuals who were genetically best equipped to thrive and survive and succeed in an environment dominated by language were the ones who left the most offspring, and that probably in our forefathers that probably led to an improvement in the ability to use language. What exactly was the evolutionary purpose of language? Was it to discuss water holes, weapons, what lay over the hill? Or might it have had another advantage?